give him a welcome. And let him Thank you so much. Um, is it okay if I'm right here, or should I go? Are you okay? All right. You can hear me okay? <laughs> well, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm, I got into uh, the Denver area two days ago, so um, this is my actually my second phase of a book tour. My first, the book actually came out, Border Patrol Nation, which I usually have in my hand, but I forgot to bring up. Um, came out uh, in March, and um, so I did a little bit of a tour, or a big tour, in the spring, and now I'm starting up my fall tour. So I'm here in Colorado, and then I'm going to do an East Coast leg of the tour a little bit later on in the fall. So it's really an honor to be here with you tonight. Um, I, I battle traffic all the way from the north side of Denver to get here. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, um, let me uh, get started. Um, maybe a good place to start would be the summer, some of the things that happened in the summer. And I don't know if, if folks saw the, everyone here is uh, familiar with Sean Hannity, right? The, the, the reporter from Fox News. Or the, yeah. Um, there's a, on July 10th, he was doing a, he was doing an investigative report on the, on the U.S.-Mexico border in the state of Texas. And uh, he was um, with Governor Rick Perry of, of Texas. And I don't know if anyone saw this report, but they were on the, they were on the um, Rio Bravo or the Rio Grande. Um, and Rick Perry actually had a black flak jacket on. And um, between Hannity and Perry, there was a machine gun. The machine gun was aimed across the river, so towards Mexico. Um, the, the, point, the point of the investigation was that, was that they were trying to prove, this was right before Rick Perry um, uh, ordered 1,000 National Guard to the, to, the, to the Texas border. It was right before that, it was like five days before that. But uh, the point was to show this border is porous, right? This is a... Uh, this border, there's nothing on the border. Um, it's it's been neglected by the federal government, and that was that's a whole that was a whole point of of Perry's report. And and of course, this was happening right in the heat of the moment with the with the children. You know, there was all, you know, is all over the media that there were you know thousands of children arriving to the southern border from from Central America, from Honduras, from El Salvador, from Guatemala. Um, now I think the number is in this year it's uh, sixty six thousand. Um, kids. Um, so, I first, how many, pe how many people here have been to the U.S.-Mexico border? Quite a few. Quite a few. Okay. Now, in your opinion, I I'll pose the question to you, is the border porous? No. Not hardly. Not hardly. In spots. In spots. In spots. Okay. Um, so, Okay, let's back up one bit. How many, okay, um, does anybody know when the Border Patrol was founded? I Guesses. Was no. When was it? <laughs> when was it, Maureen? 1924, right? So between 1776 and 1924, there was no Border Patrol, right? It was founded in 1924, there was less than 1,000, less than 1,000 agents. So what was the growth of the U.S. Border Patrol from, say, 1924 to 1994? How many Border Patrol agents were there in 1994? A thousand? Thousands. Okay, 4,000. So you have to look. It went from about 500 to 4,000 over a span of how many years? 70 years. That's a fairly slow rate of growth. It was an agency that was more or less of an afterthought. In, in, the, in the eyes of the U.S. government. What changed? 1994 to now, how many border, U.S. Border Patrol agents are there now? Any guesses? 10,000. More. More. Less. 23,000. 23,000 U.S. Border Patrol agents. So the growth from 1994 to, to 2014, 20 years, was astronomical. 
unprecedented, historic. Um, never have we had so many US Border Patrol agents, five times the size as it was in 1994. Um, now, uh, one of the significant changes was 9-11, right? There, was, there were operations before 9-11 that increased the personnel in the Border Patrol, but after 9-11, you saw an agency go from about 8,000 to 23,000 in just a matter of a few years. And you saw the Border Patrol go from the Department of Justice to the Department of Homeland Security. And that, and that was the creation of Customs and Border Protection, which is the parent agency of the US Border Patrol. And Customs and Border Protection has 65,000 agents, right? The, the reason I bring up Customs and Border Protection is because it not only includes the Border Patrol, and not only includes the people in the ports of entry, like the customs agent, they have an a office of Air and Marine. So they, they have an Air Force and they have a Navy. They have um, a special, special Forces units. So we're looking at what some people are beginning to call a domestic army on US soil. You add to that ICE. ICE did not exist pre-9-11. ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. That's 20,000. So you add, you go 65,000 plus 20,000, you're 80,000 um, agents, all under the Department of Homeland Security, which is about 200,000. So that's a huge mission within the Department of Homeland Security, right? You add to that 650,000 police. 650,000 police who are working with ICE in different programs, who are working with the Border Patrol and CBP, in different programs. So you're talking a huge, huge shifts in, uh, and, um, and then it's this kind of um, massive uh, um, growth that, that I, I, um, I, I document in Border Patrol Nation. Um, but well, there's one kicker, and this is that we're gonna go back to the Sean, the, the Sean Hannity report on the border, on the actual borderline. Could you? Um, one kicker is that that's the borderline, right? You see that? The borderline is no longer just a line. It's not just, it is a line. You can call it the boundary line. The actual border enforcement zones, and this is what this map is. This map was done by the ACLU, and they call it a constitution-free zone. That is, um, from, the, from, the, from the international boundary, 100 miles inland, along the 2,000 mile U.S.-Mexico border, up the coast, along the 4,000 mile U.S.-Canada border, and down the east coast, that is all Border Patrol jurisdiction. Um, so, um, so for example, so for example, let's, let me back up again about the growth. Budget, if you look at the budget, for the Border Patrol. Obviously, with the personnel, the budget rises as well. You look at the budget, again, 1994, somewhat of an afterthought, 2014. Now the budgets for Border and Immigration Enforcement, and that includes Customs and Border Protection and, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and it comes to $18 billion. Now, why is that, why is that number significant? Anybody know? That number is really significant because that is more than all other federal law enforcement agencies combined. Combined. Big federal law enforcement agencies like the FBI, the DEA, the US Marshals, all of those combined come to $14.4 billion. So it's about $4 billion more than all, all of the rest of the federal law enforcement agencies combined. It is a high priority for the US, US federal government. This has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. So to st sit on the border and say, oh, there's nothing here, there's no, it's neglected, it's far from the truth. If you look at the budgets over the span of the last 20 years, rising, 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 personnel rising, 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 and all of this gets put into these jurisdictions. And the jurisdictions are important because they for example, surveillance towers, they're not put on the, there's a camera post put on the actual borderline, but surveillance towers are put 10 miles, 15, 20 miles back. Checkpoints, has anybody, has anybody here gone through a, a border patrol checkpoint? They're all over this, in the Southwest? They're all over the place, right? You can't, you can't travel without 
stopping at a checkpoint where an agent of the Department of Homeland Security looks at you, does a visual inspection of your car, asks you your citizenship. If something alarms them, if they think, okay, there's three priority missions for the U.S. Border Patrol. One of them is immigration enforcement. So if they think that you're undocumented or if they think you're, 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 you have an undocumented person in the car, then they can pull you in a secondary inspection and ask you a number of questions. There, another mission is drug interdiction. If they think you're smuggling drugs or their dogs, because they have lots of dogs that sniff out your cars, if their dogs alarm them, and there's a lot of false alarms actually, they're, started, they're gonna do an ACLU and, and Arizona's gonna do a report on that soon. Um, they could pull you in a secondary inspection, they could search your car, and, but does anybody know what the number one mission in the post 9-11 era of the US Border Patrol is? Terrorism. Terrorism, that's the big change. So the number one priority mission, go to cbp.gov, look it up, it's right there, um, is to stop terrorists and weapons of mass destruction from entering the United States. So you have those three missions and those missions, that's what, so if you get pulled over in those jurisdictions right here, um, if, uh, if, they're, if they, they're not gonna ask you for your driver's license or they're not gonna ask you, they're not gonna pull you over for speeding. Probably the first, I've been pulled over by Border Patrol, they'll ask you your citizenship first. But if they suspect any of those things about you, you know, they could detain you. Um, and, and so that's, uh, that's a, a poor, important way to conceptualize um, what the border is now. Of course, if you look the, along the California coast, of course, the Border Patrol is not all the way up there, you know, in certain places along the East Coast. I don't think they're in North Carolina, the actual U.S. Border Patrol. But the fact is the blueprints laid out. And they are in surprising places, more and more surprising places. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but that's essentially the core of what, I, what I'm talking about in Border Patrol Nation. What I do in Border Patrol Nation is I look at that, look at this massive expansion, but I try to get the stories. I go and talk to all kinds of different people. I talk from, I talk, I've interviewed probably dozens of Border Patrol agents, you know, Border Patrol agents ranging in all kinds of spectrums and viewpoints of what, what it is to be a Border Patrol agent, including dissent, including dissenting agents, including dissenting agents that are working and not really expressing their dissent, to gung-ho agents as well. Um, I interview politicians, I interview un undocumented people, I interview activists, you know. I try to get the stories the core stories of what this means, of, of this expansion. That's, that's the core narrative of the book. And one of the things I look at is how, how these, um, these areas are filled. And if you could, um, one, of, um, one of the things I, I try to look into is um, the idea of a, is there a variation of an, of an industrial complex? And does anybody know what this is, the Border Security Expo? Has anybody here heard of it? You have? Border Security Expo, you can't, over there you can see it better. Intelligence, collaboration, technology, innovation. This is a yearly expo. One of the things I did for, during my research of Border Patrol Nation was go to a number of trade shows around the, around the country. The primary trade show around border security is this one. It happens every year in Phoenix, usually in March. You all should go this year. <laughs> um, but it, the, what it says down there, intelligence, collaboration, technology, innovation, kind of speaks for, for what, what it's about. So anybody have a guess what this is? It's a, basically a conference. A lot of de high level Department of Homeland Security officials come. High level ICE, high level CBP, they talk about what the future is, the future, what, how we're going to bolster our borders, what we need on the border, what, what, you know, what are some of the technologies, how, what are the strategies going to be? This is the kind of thing, things that people talk about. But there's also another really important sector that shows up. Any guesses? Private sector. Vendors. Vendors. Private, private uh, companies. Private companies. Uh, um, show up to, and they have a big exhibition hall. Um, and so you go in to, to the expo, and if you, uh, 
you, you might look up and it's a high ceiling into, in, a, in a room and you'll see like banners of different companies that probably people recognize. You'll see Raytheon, for example, Lockheed Martin, um, Boeing, uh, to name a few. Uh, also, you'll see what this, an aerostat, that's called an aerostat, and it's a surveillance balloon. And um, the, I, you know, one of the vendors, I talked to a vendor of, of, of one of these surveillance balloons once, and he, and it was, it was, he pointed to the, the, to the ceiling and he said, there's my surveillance balloon way across the room. And he said, I can, but I can um, hone in on your notebook and read, read your words on your, on your, on your paper, on your, and I said, no, no, there's no way you can do that. It's like, yes, I can. And we went back and forth like that. No, yes, no, yes. And then he started manipulating his, the camera with a kind of Xbox controller. Next thing I know, there's my page, <laughs> there's my page on a monitor like that, all my words for everyone to read in that, in the expo. Um, so uh, that's one. Um, in 2013, the masterpiece of, of the expo was this, was this tower. It was right in the middle of, that, of the conference hall. And um, I said, well, I'm going to go to this tower. I'm going to climb up all the stairs. Because from the top of the stairs, you can see the whole expo. You can see the 200, or 200 uh, um, vendors you know, selling their wares. You could see all their wares. You could see the surveillance towers. You can see the cameras. You can see the guns. You could see um, the drones. There's, they sell drones, or mini drones, including mini drones. And so I, I, I walked up the stairs, and to my left-hand side as I walked up the stairs, there's a gigantic photo of that very anti-ballistic tower withstanding a, a gigantic fireball. And I went, whoa. Like, fireballs are in the U.S.-Mexico border? Really? <laughs> Does anybody here hear, heard of fireballs hitting the U.S.-Mexico border? Anybody? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe it'll happen. <laughs> there had, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any sort of a, sort of um, um, uh, there hasn't been a fireball that's hit the U.S.-Mexico border yet. But who knows? Um, but that's the kind of thing. The, the reason I bring this up too, that's 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 the kind of thing that's that happens at these high-powered. Uh, Expos is this kind of, this dance between homeland security, border security, and private interest. And private interests definitely want to sell their product, so they definitely want to create a need. And so you go back and forth, and then that kind of imagination of what this border is. Then you go back to Rick Perry in the flak jacket or somebody with a machine gun, right? And that. Um, so that's the kind of thing you see in, in, in these. Uh, in these. Um, could you? Uh, yeah. So um, this, so this is just another example. It's a, it's a, it's a um, tactical vast and uh, night vision goggles. Um, the, this is a FLIR, which is, actually has a, a contract with Customs and Border Protection. They sell, they sell um, thermal cameras that sense body heat, um, and and you know high-powered, sophisticated camera equipment. They already have a big multi-million-dollar contract with CBP. Um, that's another example, fixed wing aircraft. These are the kinds of things that people are trying to sell. Um, this is one of my favorites. The, I know the vendor every year. I say that I go in and there he is sitting there right at the beginning. And he said, hey, do you want another sample bag? And I'm like, sure. And it's as advertised. Um, the, the, the bag contains a urine bag, and you can, you can go to the bathroom, and it, and it will crystallize. But the thing I always, I, you know, I haven't asked him because I feel bad asking him, but I, I, well, I, I want to tell him, you know, most Border Patrol agents are way out in the desert. Why would they, they could go, you know? But that's it. That's it goes to show there's a lot of different products being sell, sold. They're not necessarily just technologies or, or guns or there's... There's ready to meet, uh, ready to eat meals that, um, you know, have a three year storage life. You know, there's, there's Ray-Ban sunglasses that are military grade that are sold. You know, there's all kinds of different products that are sold. Is the version of that the same as the men? That's the thing. I'm glad you mentioned that because that is definitely made for men. <laughs> it, there's, unless, <laughs> there is not a women, a women's version for that, which is a very good point. There is, for, yeah, or at least not in the sample bag, you know, that's not in the sample bag. What, what proportion of uh, Border Patrol agents are women? 
there is a small, there's a very, it's very small percentage. Um, it's below, I think it's below 10. I don't know the exact number, but I, I, I believe it's under 10%. But there are, there are, there are women border patrol agents and I do see them all the time in the field. Just there's way, way more men. Um, this is another, uh, you know, company. I, f I find their slogan really interesting. You draw the line and we'll, we'll help you secure it, right? So this company was actually selling surveillance towers and surve a surveillance system with an operational control room. So they are vying for one of the contracts that was actually awarded in the spring and they didn't get the contract, but they have, they actually have built, help bolster borders in Jordan in, other, in Egypt and other places overseas. So they're trying to bring their technology of a surveillance system, you know, with a kind of war room where agents sit and watch, you know, this, these cameras as they, as they detect people two, three, four, five miles down the way. Uh, but I, fi I find their, uh, their slogan interesting, you draw the line, we'll help you secure it, because that raises a lot of provocative questions. Uh, who, who draws the line, right? I can draw the line. You can draw the line. Can you draw the line? If you can, you draw the line. If you had the money and you draw the line right through this, through this, through this, um, right here, through this room, and they come and secure it. If you had the line, if you had the money to 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 do that, thus separating one side from the other, would they do that? I mean, it raises all kinds of provocative questions. Is the line already drawn? Right, but there there are lines that are drawn, but can they not be moved or? other lines drawn in other places or what if a line needs to be drawn here or, or there or you know how far you know how far does this line drawing go i mean that those are the kind of questions it lends itself to could you um and then this is uh i talked to this vendor for quite a while um uh the technology the technology that he was selling was called freedom on the move uh freedom on the move um he was a very interesting person to talk to because he talked about the actual border situation in very vivid language. And he actually used football terms to describe the, the actual, for example, the border line was a line of scrimmage. So then the border crossers were crossing the border line undetected, right? And so, oh, let me back up here. Why would, why would he say that? Why would he be saying that the border crossers were crossing the line undetected? He's, yeah, he wants to sell, but if you think about it, um, what he is saying is that most border crossers are not crossing through urban areas. This is where we go back to the idea of a porous border, right? They're not crossing through the urban areas which have the 18 foot high walls, that have the camera posts, that have the agents sitting their exes side by side by side by side, that have a concentration. It's almost impossible to cross in the urban areas. So, and this, these come from the, this comes from the operations actually from the mid 1990s. It's a strategy called prevention by deterrence. So the idea is close off these areas where people traditionally crossed, like Nogales used to have a um, chain link fence in the early, you know, up to 1990, there was a chain link fence and people would cross through the hole in the fence and uh, so on and so forth. Close off these areas and, and then people would be forced to go around them into areas that were so remote, so dangerous, so desolate that it would be a natural barrier to them crossing. That was the idea. What happened was not quite that. So these, these first operations like that happened in the mid-1990s. At the same time, um, Mac, the, the, the immigration from Mexico went upsurged. Um, it was a post-NAFTA era, the immediate post-NAFTA era in, in, in Mexico. You see this, what was almost, it was unprecedented immigration coming from Mexico from about 1995 to 2005, about 400,000, 500,000 people per year. And they'd hit these enforcement zones and go around them and end up crossing the border undetected, right? Through the Arizona desert, which was supposed to be a natural barrier. Um, people are still crossing the border undetected, right? I just interviewed a woman who uh, was walking through the desert for eight days. 
on the fourth day, and, and she was walking through the mountains. On the fourth day, she, they ran out of water, or um, they ran out of food. So that when, they, when you run out of water, you start drinking really dirty water from cow, cow troughs. Um, you run, they ran out of food. So she started describing walking and hallucinating. She started talking about the mountains speaking to her as they walked. Then she remembers, like she starts really, va she started vaguely remembering some incidents like, we arrived to the, to the road and then somebody called because a lot of us were desperate and they called the border patrol so they'd come. And then she described a scenario where four or five people in the group, start, their noses started spontaneously bursting with blood. And then she, then, then she, 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 I guess she passed out. And when she woke up, she, she had ele an electronic shock um, machine on her chest. She was in a hospital um, and she thinks that she died but she didn't, and came back to life, that she was resuscitated. Um, who knows, but that, her story is, is a rather common one. It's a common one for, uh, since the 1990s, um, 6,000 remains of border crossers have been found. Uh, people, it's impossible to walk through the desert without having some sort of health issue after, usually dehydration. Um, it's super, super hot in the summer. And, um, and so when, when, could you, um, could you turn it one more? So this, uh, so when he was saying that the, the people cross the border undetected, um, he was saying then they, this technology, which is basically a video camera surveillance system mounted on the back of a truck, um, would get them in the quote unquote last mile. So he said that it would be like a roving, in the football terminology, it would be like a roving linebacker, right? So, uh, so after the people walk two, three, four days, five days, sometimes even longer, when they're weak, this is when freedom on the move comes in. And, and I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna stress that, that he, as a vendor, he's, he's talking to me and I'm journal, a journalist and I'm, I definitely have a tag that says I'm a journalist, but he's, he's selling me his product, right? He's, he's a vendor. He thinks, you know, that he's talking to me, trying to sell me the product. He's not, he knows I'm not going to buy it, but he's, he probably hopes as a journalist, I will write favorably about his product. Um, and, and it's this kind of, why wouldn't he think that way? You know, if you look, if you look at the border security market, and there is a border security market now, and you look at the different market projections, every single one of them show a, 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 the border security market growing, growing at at least a 5% clip. Um, the most recent projection I saw had it growing at, um, and they said it was an unprecedented boom period for border security. Um, it is a good thing to invest in. It is, um, uh, it is so he, the, he is talking to this market that he knows is expanding. It's a global market. One example is video surveillance. Video surveillance, the market for video surveillance in 2012, $12 billion. The market projection for 2020, $40 billion. So it's what it's almost, it's more than triple the projection. Um, in, in 2020, it says, they say that they're gonna get 3.4 trillion video hours of footage. And, and I did the calculations, it's 340 million um, hours of, no, 300, 340 million years of, uh, of um, video footage in one year. That's, that's, what, that's what's being anticipated. That's, that's, that's the future that's being actually projected at, at kind of these, these, these expos. Who's supposed to be reviewing the footage? Pardon me? Who is going to be reviewing Well, it depends. I mean, it's, this, is glo this is actually, what I'm not talking about is just in the United States. This is actually a global projection. So we're looking at borders all over the world and probably a lot of it nobody will be reviewing. It's just cameras, you know, just out there. Now, does that come down to a camera for every man, woman, and child in the U.S.? Because if we're supposed to be a population of 330 million. Y yeah, yeah, except that's global, right? Okay. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a lot of cameras and a lot of footage and, and um, but that's just one example. If you look at any of the kind of gadgets, the technologies that we're seeing with border security, all of it's increasing, and that's just one example of it. Um, so, so 
So when you go to uh, when you go to the um, Border Security Expo, it is almost like going into a, a sort of science fiction pavilion in a way. And some of the stuff you see, it's you know, are you serious? This is, nobody's going to put this on the border. Like the the mini drones I was talking about. Like there's frisbee like drones, and you throw it, and if, and you can then you know you know guide it, and then it has cameras equipped to it. There's other there's other mini drones as they call them that they're studying locust wings. Locust wings for these real mini drones that can get into crevices and get into areas that, you know, that maybe they normally get, you know, a predator to be drone couldn't get into. But uh, you think like it's science fiction, there's a lot of this that probably won't show up on the border. But then again, you know, you look at it, like those are the fleet of predator bee drones that the, board, the US Border Patrol has now. And if you go back 20 years ago, would we have thought it? You know, would you know would it have been possible to think that planes that were controlled by people on the ground of that size, um, with high-tech surveillance equipment and radar, would uh, be flying over and doing surveillance missions over the borderlands? That might have you might am like reading a science fiction novel or something. Um, the you know there's you know there's the kind of stuff that you know the kind of high-tech stuff that you see on the border um, now, you know, you might, it, it probably, in ways, it probably would have seemed unfathomable. Please. Um, this is a Border Patrol agent. It's one of the CBP agents. It's a Special Forces unit. Did you know that Border Patrol agents look like that? No, there's been drastic changes. It's some sort of high-powered assault rifle, I think. I don't know what his weapon is exactly. <laughs> and then here, I was just, the, I was just driving along uh, in the border of New Mexico, just going on, on my way to El Paso, and I come across this, this armored vehicle, and, it, and I found it quite surprising. And there was, the soldier was not out when I passed it. So I stopped the car, turned around, and as I turned around, the soldier came out. So I came around and spun around, and, the soldier, and I waved at the soldier, and the soldier waved back, and then I took this picture. And then when I took this picture, he was looking at the surveillance. He's, he's about 10 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. He's pointed to the south towards the border. Uh, I didn't know what he was at that point. I didn't know what sort of mission it was. So I kept going about 10 miles up the road. There's another one of these armored vehicles, and it's a striker. It's, a, it's a, called a striker, and, they, and it's a surveillance striker. You know, it doesn't, it, doesn't have a, it doesn't have a weapon system on it, so it's mainly a highly sophisticated surveillance um, armored vehicle that you see in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this second time, this guy was, the guy was uh, posted with a Border Patrol agent, so side by side. And then I go up another 10 miles, and there's another one posted with a Border Patrol agent side by side. And I get up another 10 miles, and there's a forward operating base. Forward operating base... Um, another, th another thing used that used in, for U.S. wars abroad that have been exp now imported to the to the U.S. borderlands. Um, it's it's a it's kind of a tactical rudimentary base put in really isolated areas to gain territorial control. That's that's the point of them. In this area, there is one of them. In that forward operating base, there are several of these tanks or armored vehicles, strikers. Um, so it was obvious, obvious at that time it was a Border Patrol mission, a joint task force. And then I figured out later it was indeed a joint task force. It was between the military and the Border Patrol. And um, that's one of many that happened on a, you know, on a yearly basis. It was a five-day joint task force mission. And then the strikers went back to Fort Bliss. What is that thing that looks like a That is me nervously taking a picture of a soldier. So my can the can you know, as I drove, I wasn't stopping, so the motion, I think that's from the motion. So, so in addition to the interviews at the beginning, you were talking, you were talking about 80,000 semi-different people that were part of Border Patrol. You also just mentioned the military. So the Border Patrol sometimes has military yeah. attached to it. Yeah, or they do the joint task forces with the military. Um, and sometimes it's, it's that, I guess it's patrolling. Other times the military will go, help go build the border wall or the border fence. 
I think a lot of that 700 miles of fencing and walls, barriers that we see on the U.S.-Mexico border was built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, there's different, you know, they build roads, they do all kinds of stuff. And so, so yeah, there's, there's plenty of joint task forces with the military. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure on that, on that case. I know there was a case where um, Brian Terry, who was a Border Patrol agent, was, he was shot and killed um, in a, after, in, in, everyone assumes, by drug smugglers um, around Nogales. And that's been a big case that a lot of people have talked about. But I'm not sure about, about the case that you're mentioning. Yeah. Does anybody know where that is? Very. <laughs> Good answer. You're, you are correct. You know, last it's, night when I was looking at it, I thought it's not somewhere south by the looks of the trees. There you go. Somebody's giving, giving a, a good clue. Denver? Denver? Could be, right? Could be Denver. <laughs> it's not Denver. Any more guesses? Usually people will guess because Maureen gave it away. Canada. What? Border of Canada. It's the border of Canada. But it's, um, this is, so this is SOTUS, New York. Usually people will guess Texas, Tucson, you know, California. Yeah, but this is actually in SOTUS, New York. Anybody know where SOTUS, New York is? Okay, that's the interesting thing about SOTUS, New York. It's about 15 miles away from Rochester, New York. Where's the border with, Ro where's that border? Where? Yeah, it's uh no, it's east of Ro it's east of Rochester. So where yeah the yeah the act oh actually the border the border crossing is far away, right? It's in Buffalo. It's in Niagara Falls. It's yeah, it's two mi two two hours away is the border actual border line. But Rochester has a lakeshore, right? And the lakeshore is the border. And so in 2005. The first border patrol station happened and they created the first border patrol station in Rochester. And the logic was that in Toronto, they were from Toronto, they were creating a ferry line between Toronto and Rochester. And so, oh, they need a border patrol. And that was the logic. The, the ferry line closed down in 2006. Obviously, the border patrol did not close down. The border patrol started, the station started with five agents. Do you think they reduced the agents after the ferry closed down? Do you think they expanded them? Yes, they expanded them at approximately the rate of expansion that we're seeing on the U.S.-Canada border, which is higher rate of expansion than on the U.S.-Mexico border. Yep. So it went from, in the Rochester's case, it went from four agents to 26 agents. Wow. Still considerably less than, you know, you have, you know, approximately 18,000 agents on the U.S. southern border, and you have about a little over 3,000 on the U.S. northern border, but the rate of expansion has been higher. Um, and, the, and one thing about SOTUS, right? So that the, the idea, actually, from an official standpoint, the U.S.-Canada border, there's more of a likelihood that there would be a terrorist incursion into the United States through the 4,000 mile U.S. Canada border than, on the, than through the U.S. southern border with Mexico. So that's the, that's the logic. That's the USA Patriot Act in 2001 called for a 300% increase of personnel and resources on the U.S. Canada border. Um, other legislation has said it when, during the hiring boom of the Border Patrol between 2005 and 2008, there was they, uh, um, at least 20% of the Border Patrol agents hired have to go to the U.S. Canada border. So there's stipulations that are, are increasing the amount of agents that are on, on this border. And one thing about it is that, notice that the agent is in SOTUS, New York. He's, in, he's not on the borderline, right? He's at a grocery store. He's talking to a US, New York state trooper from the blue car. Um, and one thing about SOTUS is it's in Wayne County. Wayne County is known for its apple orchards. There are lots of apple orchards. The soil by the lake is just absolutely fabulous to grow apples. 
Um, so that brings in a, you bring in a lot of farm workers, 8,000 farm workers per year to, to Wayne County, New York. Um, the, the farm workers go to that grocery store marketplace. Um, one of, they go to all the, you know, there's, they go to the church where there's actually, there was a border patrol raid in the span during the, after the Spanish language mass at the local Catholic church. Um, so much that the community of Soda started a, started a group, I think it was called Church Watch, where they would stand out in front of the church every Sunday. Um, and they staged, they set up a checkpoint or New York state troopers set up a checkpoint on Sundays, on Sundays in front of the laundromat. So Sundays, obviously the day that people are going to go do their laundry and they have to go through a checkpoint. New York State Troopers, three cars and one Border Patrol agent. If the state troopers were to suspect that, uh, that a person doesn't have documents, then they send them to the Border Patrol. And, and so this is a, a reality that you're not only seeing in SOTUS, you're seeing across the, across the northern frontier from, Seattle, from uh, Washington State to Maine. Um, and if you notice, well, if you think, think back to the 100 mile map, did you remember the state of Maine? Devoured by the divorce border patrol jurisdiction, just completely, border patrol can roam anywhere in the state of Maine. Michigan, Mi Michigan as well. Yeah, no. Florida. Florida is completely a border patrol jurisdiction. Yeah. For checkpoints, are those fairly frequent? They're not as, per, you know, not as frequent in, as, in, as along the southern border, but they're very frequent, more and more frequent on the northern border. And the most famous story happened to Senator Patrick Leahy. Mm -hmm. And he was traveling near SOTUS in um, upstate New York, and he says he was 125 miles south of the border. And he was in a car that had license plates that said, Vermont Senator, it said Senator, Vermont Senator, um, and he came up to a Border Patrol checkpoint. And according to Leahy's rendition before Congress, he said that the Border Patrol agent ordered him out of his car. Um, Leahy said, under whose authority are you ordering me out of the car? And the Border Patrol agent pointed to his gun and he said, that's the only authority I need. So that's an example of a, of a northern border checkpoint. Um, yes, ma'am. I was taking Amtrak from Denver to New York, and we were 100 miles south, but I don't remember exactly where because they woke us up. The Border Patrol woke us up to go through. Yeah. So that's another thing, transportation checks. Um, one of the most, the, Rochester, New York, has become a hub for transportation checks. The um, Border Patrol you regularly gets on the Amtrak or the Greyhound or the different bus lines that run through there. A lot of times they're like Denver to New York. They're not crossing a border. They're going through the interior of the country, yet um, an agent will come on, he'll ask, per, you know, he or she will ask you know, everybody about their citizenship. The same sort of criteria within the 100 mile zone. Are you undocumented? Are you, are you a drug smuggler? Are you a national security threat? Could get you pulled off into secondary questioning and many people have been detained. One quick thing, too, about that. There was a Freedom of Information Act um, request done about the arrests at the Rochester, just at the Rochester Border Patrol Station alone during these transportation checks. And according to the documents, one of the documents, they, it showed that they had classified the arrest by skin complexion. And that's, that's exact. Uh, um, words, wording they use, skin complexion, and medium complexion, 70%, black complexion, 12%, fair complexion, 0.8%. So that's, if, that, if that rings true across the U.S.-Canada uh, US divide, which I think you're going to find similar numbers across, that would show you what, is, what might really be going on on the U.S.-Canada border. So now they're going 
Italian raising Spanish language masses. Really, is it about um, getting, I mean, the southern border just extending all the way up to the northern border? Because they're not really, they're not really looking at Canadians. And they're probably not even looking at, at Middle Eastern terrorists as much as they're looking at any, any Latin Americans that have come up. Is that, is that accurate? Or? I would say, you mean, just going by that, um, that the, the kind of like, the arrest records from the Rochester Border Patrol Station. Yeah, I mean, I think that tells us a, a very um, vivid story about who's actually being questioned, who's being, you know, what if a Border Patrol agent gets on an Amtrak train or goes to the, goes to, uh, the grocery store or goes to the laundromat where farm workers are going, who are they going to end up arresting? Um, I mean, that it's, it's, you know, they say something different, you know. The rhetoric around the buildup on the, on the U.S.-Canada border, they say it's more about terrorism. But you see a lot of the internal enforcement. You see that 100-mile zone, you see it covered even beyond it. In Leahy's case, it was a, he says it was 125 miles south. So that was past the 100-mile zone. So, so the idea that, and that's the thing about the northern border as well. In Rochester, 10 years ago, there wasn't any border patrol there. Erie, Pennsylvania. Again, Lakeshore, right? 20, 10 years ago, was there border patrol there? No. Detroit, yes, 10 years, 10 years ago, there were border patrol. In fact, Detroit Station, El Paso Station, were the first two stations created in 1924. But there were few. There was only 40 in the Detroit sector. Now there's 400. Everyone in southwest Detroit, which is a Latin American neighborhood, has a story about the Border Patrol. There's, you know, a guy going to work at 4 a.m. at the bus stop has been stopped and uh, arrested by the Border Patrol. A guy going to the, La the Latino Family Community Center was stopped and, you know, by the Border Patrol in question. So you, there's lots and lots of stories uh, about who's being arrested and who's not. And there's some places where right along the borderline, you're not going to see the big walls like you see in Mexico. But there are places like the St. Clair River between Port Huron and, and Detroit, where you see 11 surveillance towers side by side by side by side by side with their high power cameras, with the radar that look into Ontario. Um, and the feeds, the radar, the video feeds come back to this $30 million operational control room in Selfridge. Selfridge uh, Selfridge is a military base near Detroit. Now, mind you, Detroit's, Detroit's the city that just turned off the water. You know, the, Detroit's been a, is a city that's been cutting tr public transportation. It's, Detroit's a city that's, if you go to Detroit, how many people have been to Detroit? Yeah, there's some now there are. Right. The, the homes are collapsing in Detroit. And yet, right up the road, there's a $30 million um, operational control room with a gigantic video wall where they where agents sit and watch the feeds of the radar of the videos of you know of the St. Clair River flowing by um, for hours and hours and hours and hours so um, that's you know yeah you get some good wildlife probably <laughs> all right you can go ahead Yeah, oh, I said, yeah, two-thirds, yeah. um, 200 million people approximately live. So if you notice, it goes through all the major population centers, uh, L.A., New York, um, Chicago, I think, is in it. So that's another thing to think about as well, like when you think about the, the, the drones, for example, when they do, they're flying at 30,000 feet. Who sees them? Where are they flying? Are they flying in the 100-mile zones? Are they flying over the city of Tucson, where I live? Are they flying over the city of San Diego? Are they flying over New York? Are they flying over Chicago? Are they, where are they flying? They can fly anywhere within this jurisdiction. So that's, it's an important consideration. Even if you, even not even considering undocumented immigration, if you just consider this idea, you know, the connection that you could have with the National Security Agency and all the talk that's been around the National Security Agency these days. You know, what kind of, you know, if, if the surveillance equipment, like where I live, you can't go anywhere without, you know, being on camera 500 times. You know, the, those, those, and uh, there's, I have to go, if I go, every time I go, to go down the I-19 away from my house, there's this tower that looks into my car and just sees the heat of my body, 
you know? That's, the, I mean, that's, that's all around, and, and this is extending deep into the United States. And you can go, you could even make the case that it's, you know, as the talk has been around police agencies and recently as well, that this is going further and further inland. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's... Yeah. That they're giving away, uh, that they're taking advantage of that, and uh, uh, it's, it certainly changes the nature of, of uh, human interaction. But the other thing is, what, so what percentage, I mean, have they, you know, is there been, how many cases of uh, people who were bringing in toxic stuff to the United States have they found? Terrorism, you mean? Zero. 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 Nothing. nothing documented. There's this possibility that something's happened that hasn't been released to the public, yeah. which I doubt because a lot, you know, if, if something happens overseas, it's front page news, you know. You figure that if, if that would have happened, we'd know about it. There's a possibility it hasn't. I mean, a lot of people were like, if you ask people about terrorism, they'll refer to the Millennium, the millennium Bomber. He tried to come into the United States in 1999 through the u.s canada border and he was had a bombs and and so you know they'll point to that incident and say hey they're that astute you know border guard and he actually was coming through a port of entry that astute border guard you know you know to credit for stopping whatever intentions the that guy had but that's it's in the post 9 11 era there has been absolutely nothing yet but that's a key point all this all this like upsurge of, uh, of budgets and resources and technologies and the, and the war posture, the militaristic posture you're seeing, the increasing militaristic posture, it, it comes from this idea of a war on terror, right? So that raises a really important question. When you have coming through like this summer, this summer, you know, you saw, you, everyone here saw the pictures of, of the children, right? The children, 66,000 children have come across. You have people coming across like those children who, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, a lot of them have testimonies of, of fearing violence, you know, back in their home countries. A lot, of, a lot of them are trying to reunite with their family members, you know. And those are, you know, the, the majority of people. Imagine if it's not 60,000 terrorists, they're talking about 60,000 children from Central America. Yet, there's Rick Perry and... Um, and uh, Sean Hannity with a machine gun aimed at Mexico during the, the during the height of the of, of the of the of these the, of this influx of children. And they weren't even sleeping. No, they were they were turning themselves in. Yeah, totally turning themselves in. So. Well, I have to keep coming back to that eighteen billion dollar figure and thinking how much we're not doing in this country to help people and to prevent violence within the borders with, because we don't have the money because all this money is yeah. in there to defense. And yeah. It's Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, look at Detroit. Like, why is, why is all the money funneled into Homeland Security, $30 million into this, op, this war room, pretty much, when, and when they're cutting off water service to the people that live there? It doesn't make sense. Um, if, you know, housing, you know, different, you know, employment opportunities, education, public transportation, you know, I actually look into this in the very, in the very last chapter of Border Patrol Nation. I, I grew up in Niagara Falls, New York. Niagara Falls, New York has a similar trajectory as Detroit. It was an industrial town. Niagara Falls um, did not put its eggs in the tourism basket. It put its eggs in the, in the, in the in industry and it had chemical and metallurgical industry. My dad worked in a chemical fat in a, a plant in, in Niagara Falls. Um, this industry started leaving the city like, in, like many places, much like many places in the, in the Rust Belt, like Buffalo. Um, my dad lost his job in, in the year 2000. And the kind of almost destruction that you see in Niagara Falls, like the, the houses that have fallen, it looks nothing like it did when I was a kid. Main Street Niagara Falls is completely boarded up, right? 
Um, the, there's so many potholes through the city that I feel like I'm going to go down in the Grand Canyon when I'm driving through Niagara Falls. Whole, like the whole, there's whole neighborhoods that have been raised, and it looks like a war zone. It looks like a war zone. There's one area in Niagara Falls I look at, and it's just an empty field, and there's a few houses, just stumps of houses that used to be a neighborhood when I was a kid. You know, and, and you look at that and you go, wait, you know, we're putting all this money in Homeland Security because there's some sort of enemy that's going to get us right on the other side of this line. They're going to come and get us. Yet this is happening in my hometown. You know, this is what's happening to to like my people where I grew up. You know, looks like the war already hit. Looks like the bombs already fell. You know, so in, in a way, you know, this it, it's 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 a really almost powerful way to look at, you know, this, this kind of upsurge in the Homeland Security or even anything, you know, what, you know, the, the looking at the border patrol is not only looking at the border patrol, it's also looking at the solutions or, or how look, looking at the federal budget and looking how, you know, is there a better way to spend this money? What is security really? You know, that question is really important. What is security? If somebody loses their home, right, isn't that the worst possible state of insecurity one could possibly be in? So why, I mean, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it make more sense, you know, if, you're, if we're talking about security to invest in housing or, you know, so that, so that sort of uh, angle is an important one. No, um, but that's a very provocative point. You just, and people um, bring it up, you know? There's people that, uh, a lawyer, a lawyer that I was talking to in Buffalo, and they're talking about Rochester and the, bu and the people getting on the buses and pulling people off buses because they don't have the correct documents or because they look a certain way. And she said, you got to look at the 1930s in Germany. You have to. That's, and then when, and you top that off with, with uh, detention centers, 250 detention centers across the country, 34,000 people in detention center beds on any given day, and not for criminal charges, for administrative charges, because, they, you know, because they're in a deportation process. Um, and a lot of those, and, and a lot of those uh, detention centers are, are privately owned as well, so. Uh, private companies are making a lot of money. Are any of these resources used for something more ethical by human trafficking? Or well, yeah. I mean, they, they say they, that's definitely in the, in the rhetoric um, for sure. Um, they'll talk about human trafficking quite a bit. Like, we want to break up the trafficking rings, the dr you know, human trafficking, drug trafficking, uh, you know, those sorts of, I mean, that's definitely a, 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 a strong talking point for the, the, you know, CBP or the Border Patrol, how much, and, and if they do, you know, catch somebody in a trafficking ring, that's, there's the, definitely a, like an article written about it or it's, it's made public. Um, the percentage of that compared to just like somebody walking across, you know, just a, you know, somebody coming across to get a job or now a kid trying to reunite with their parents or is, is very low, but, they do say that and, that, and, I, and they do have operations around um, trafficking. Chances are, my experience is that somebody who carries a gun, his IQ soars downward, so <laughs> they couldn't catch one if they tried. <laughs> it just seems that's the impression I <laughs> That's a, <laughs> 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 probably, <laughs> probably a sound impression, I would, you know, and I talked, you know, I interviewed a lot of Border Patrol agents um, for, to write the book. And, and, and there's a lot of, the, the guy that, one of the guys I, I interviewed, he was a gun instructor. At, um, he worked out of the Casa Grande station in Arizona. He, but he taught guns. You know, he taught to shoot guns. He's like, oh, I just have a talent doing it. And, and then he said, but I hate guns. And I went, what? <laughs> and, and he actually was good. He's actually a student, too. So one of his projects is to go to gun shops and like talk to them about guns. And he's into gun reduction, gun control, and he doesn't have a gun himself. He's like, I'm the only agent that doesn't have a gun. 
So, he, he, but he's he's expert shot. He is, he is an expert shot at the same time. It's just there's so many really interesting nuances that you find with people as you you know in the variety of interviews. Um, but go ahead. What's the average age? Of, uh, there, I don't know what the average age is, but it's fairly young. Um, it's uh, I don't think they hire anyone new over the age of forty. They'll hire up till the age of 40. There are Border Patrol agents over the age of 40, but they have to be hired before the age of 40. Um, they, you know, during their hiring, hiring um, surges, they would target, you know, they targeted young, they targeted veterans or people, they go to like military bases overseas. So you've had a lot of military people join the ranks of the Border Patrol. Uh, one of them, the Buckeye Blitz, which, which was a hiring, um, uh, program they did in Ohio. They went to areas in 2008 that were really affected by the recession and they began to hire in those areas. So they would target people that were in, you know, perhaps in economic straits, so to speak. And um, uh, yeah, it, to be a Border Patrol agent, you just have to have your GED, so you don't have to have a college education. And the starting salary uh, for a Border Patrol is about 70, uh, with, with overtime, is about 70, 60 to 70,000. A rookie can make 60 to 70,000 dollars in the first year. So it's a huge draw for, for um, people in the borderlands because you're looking at country, that, you know, different communities that are, have depressed economies where a teacher makes, what, $20,000 a year. And then the Border Patrol agents, you know, they make 70, 70 grand their first year. They're driving around their, their nice cars. And, there's a lot of uh, Latino border, 50%, around 50%. Um, in Border Patrol Nation, I dedicate a chapter to, uh, to an agent who, um, who got fired. And his mother was from Mexico. And he proclaimed to another agent that he was proud to be a Mexican. Um, what he meant was that he was proud of his Mexican heritage. And that ended up in this big discussion with the agent and the agent one another agent ended up reporting him for saying that so one of the key things you should read it but one of the key things is that um that uh the agent said to him this might be true there might be 50 percent latino you know agents but the agent said to him you have to forget your mexican side he told him that and he and he responded and said no i don't i don't have to forget i love my mexican side so this sort of uh that sort of, at least in this case, and I, I was able to interview this agent who was fired like several times to get like a really vivid, like how that story unfolded. Yeah. I was going to ask you kind of what you were saying now about the morale. And it seems like you interviewed, talked to a lot of agents, and here they are doing what they're doing, and whatever that is, because it sounds yeah. like there's a lot of things that uh, we don't know about what they're doing. Yeah. So almost everyone says there's low morale from the Border Patrol Union to bor different Border Patrol agents that I've interviewed to um, Robert Lee Merrill. He did, he's an academic who did a, 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 a big study on the Border Patrol and he published a book called Patrolling Chaos and he documents the kind of low morale that he found. A lot of Border Patrol end up you know, sitting on their X's, as they call it. So they just sit in one place and they look into the empty desert all day long at nothing, right? Um, and they play video games or whatever, I don't know. There's, and there's a, an additional analysis to this that, you know, you're trained as an agent, you're trained in like, you're, gonna, you're, you know, you're on the front lines of defense. You're, you know, you're trained in this way it's almost, you know, there's a hyper, hyper patriotic way that you're, you know, you're defending the homeland, right? And so there's a lot of ad adrenaline. If you ever look at a recruiting vi uh, video for the Border Patrol, you know, they're diving out of helicopters and, you know, rappelling and doing all this exciting stuff and running around, you know, there's guns. And, and then, you know, a lot of the agents that I talk to, they're, they're, one, one, one told me of the story that where he carried a, a, a kid who died in his arms 
out of the desert, you know, and there's many stories like that where, where an agent will, you know, they think they're doing one thing, but then they see the reality of it. And in his case, he's just, he, you know, he described the story where he was describing like the kind of stuff coming out of the kid's mouth and as he carried them and how it, how it just hit him so hard. Um, lots of Border Patrol agents find dead bodies out in, and, and they, they have a chaplain, right? They have a chaplain. But if you find a dead body and, you're, and, and there's lots of, and every single agent's found a dead body. One guy told me he was walking down a, 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 the side of a hill and he actually kicked a skull as he was walking down. If you find a dead body, you continue on your shift. And I talked to an agent that, that said, that's the hardest thing you can do. You have to just, you find, he, he, found, a, he found a body that had, uh, of a woman who had just died, probably an hour before. And, and they looked at, like, he, they had to call the, it was on the Tono Altam Reservation, which is a Native American reservation, and they called the tribal police. And they came in and they turned her over and there was, she was purple, you know, because her blood had come to the, to the bottom of her body. And, um, and he helped, like, them, the tribal police, like, put her on a truck. And they had a tire on a truck, you know, so this kind of process of, dehumanization almost and and um and and then they bring you know they bring her to the you know to you know the forensic office or but uh this sort of you know those experiences that border patrol agents have and what they're expected to do and how they're expected to um and then there's thousands of these bodies that are unclaimed and unidentified yeah there's on un, there's unclaimed there's uh, the the desaparecidos you know the there's, there's bodies, you know, desconocidos, um, the unknown. There's, yeah, and then there's, they, you know, people call the desert in Arizona a graveyard. Like, some people say, you know, that only a percentage, you know, a, you know, maybe even less than half of the bodies have been found who have perished, judging by the families who are looking for their loved ones who have disappeared. Because there's different organizations in Arizona that field calls from families from Latin America, from Mexico, from Central America, who are looking for their loved ones. They say, oh, they, I think they crossed through the desert, but now we haven't heard from them in, a, in three weeks, or we haven't heard from them in a month, or we haven't heard from them in four weeks, four, four months, you know? And so there's actual rescue missions or people that go out combing the desert, but... The remains are, are brought, um, I think they're brought to a mortuary. And then there's a forensic, off, there's a forensic, uh, what's it called, like laboratory where they bring a lot of the bodies to. So they try to identify the bodies first and foremost. A lot of bodies they can ident identify. Um, but they do, and they also look for, you know, different, you know, sometimes there's some sort of, you know, memento that the person's carrying that's special to them or who knows what. But. I, there's there's some that are buried. I'm not sure what happens to all the bodies. I know that there's cemeteries that have like John Doe, um, you know, gravestones of people. I'm going to pass a basket if you want to make a little donation. Don't feel any pressure. It's just for Ty, not for us. Okay. <laughs> what, what led you particularly to write this book? This book, um, there's a lot of. Uh, reasons i guess I, I one of them is i've been working on border issues or issues involving mexico or latin america for quite some time um i have been living on and off in tucson and southern arizona since the late 1990s i lived i've lived in southern mexico as well in oaxaca and um and you know i've been working on looking at border issues um my first journalistic Thing that I did was I went and photographed the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers building a wall in Douglas, Arizona. So when they were first building the border wall in the in 1998, um, and so I've been work. You know, I worked with this organization called Border Links for four years. Um, we that that organization we went back and forth. You know, we were constantly in Mexico. Um, during that time, the, the, the upsurge from, of immigration from Mexico was unbelievable. It is literally an exodus of people coming from Mexico. And we go to this place called Altar, which is just a little bit south of the border. 
and we'd stay there for a few days and just watch the buses come in and people would unload off the buses and we talked to person after person and one time i met this guatemalan man there and he's and uh he's looking he it was one of those cases that we were just talking about his daughter disappeared like two two uh two months before that and last he'd heard that she had walked across the desert and he was with us the entire night and just hearing him and what looking at his face and 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 he was in Mexico undocumented. So he came all the way from his town. Like he lives in Huehuetenango in Guatemala. He came all the way up to the border to try to find his daughter. And he, he asked me, how could I help him find his daughter? And I knew there was no way I could help him, you know? And those stories, you know, those stories are just so, you know, there's story after story after story that are just so power, I mean, tragic, powerful, important, to, to, to document, to talk about, to bring up. And those are stories that define our world right now. And, um, and th those sorts of stories combined with the kind of upsurge of the border en enforcement, especially, you know, when I was working at Border Links, I, I started in, in June of 2001, right? So September 11, 2001 happened three months after I was with Border Links. I saw those sorts of transitions. I saw the buildup. I saw how Border Patrol changed. I saw the kind of like, you know, the, dra the drastic changes. Almost some places look nothing like they looked before. If you go, and some places are so, there's so many Border Patrol agents, like the Tolan Autumn Reservation in Southern Arizona. You go there, there's, so, there's more Border Patrol agents cruising around than there are locals now and then 10 years ago that was not the case in the 1990s there were no border patrol in the tonal automation so, so those sorts of changes and another thing about the tonal automation nation is that i have a lot of friends on the tonal automation and the talk of the not only is there a lot of border patrol looking for undocumented people crossing there's border patrol harassing people on the nation um so people are getting pulled over all the time they're being spotlighted they say that, that Border Patrol is going at 90 miles per hour through the reservation. Um, people are, have been, I interviewed a guy who was pulled out of his truck and maced. No, he was maced, pulled out of his truck, and then beaten with a baton by a, by a Border Patrol agent. Um, there's uh, home invasions throughout the Atone Altum Nation for people, anyone that lives within 25 miles of the border. That's another one of those constitution-free zone things. If you live 25 miles from the border, Border Patrol can enter your property without a warrant. So that's happening, you know, in all, in all throughout the Tone Altum Nation. Everyone's talking about home invasions, you know, stuff that you worry about if you're at war, right? And, and um, so, so the sorts of stories and, you know, and, and the, and are, are just, you know, too much, you know, and I think a lot of the stories that I heard, you know, they've deeply affected me over the years and, and that was probably one of the biggest impetuses to sit down and do this, this project. <laughs> so, have you talked to, I mean, have politicians talked to you about this? Have people... I've talked, I did, so I'm a, I'm a more of a journalist, so I'm, I'm not, I, I sought out politicians to talk to in the book, so I go and try to interview people, but I'm not there to lobby them, right? I'm just there to hear what they're, what they're pushing for. I did a, I did do a chapter on South Carolina and I interview the politician who's pushed that the, the state of South Carolina has its own border patrol, its own immigration enforcement unit. It's the only state to have its own like immigration enforcement unit at a state level with their own cars and their own uniforms and everything. Um, so yeah, I, that's in that, in that sense, I, I sought out politicians to look at their viewpoints and to look at how this kind of border policy, because a lot of politicians will say, my constituents demand, my, my constituents say that we need a bigger wall, my constituents say this and that and the other thing. Have you uh, sent your book to John Stewart? What? John oh. Stewart? What, uh, I, what have you sent him your book? Because he like, talks to people like you all the time. Yeah, I should. <laughs> maybe I'll send him my book. <laughs> but maybe I'll, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I know you write for NAGLA. Yeah. I was wondering if maybe you could speak to some of the movements, larger popular movements that are maybe pushing better relations and economic justice and something other than all this military 
Yeah, there, there's a lot. There's more and more. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of examples now. It's, I always think there could be a lot more, given the, 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 the degree of what we're seeing. But, you know, just in southern Arizona, we have a number of different movements. So, you know, no more deaths comes to mind, which is uh, they go out and put desert camps in the desert to help people who are, you know, crossing if they have if they're in distress or they need medical care or if they need water. There's lots of humanitarian organizations along those lines where they go out and put water in the desert. Um, no more deaths actually has a put. They do lots of reports, too. So they look at the Border Patrol and say they have one huge one called the culture of cruelty that looks at uh, short term detention and abuses by Border Patrol to people in short term detention. Um, so they have a number of reports like that. Uh, there's protection networks throughout Tucson, and I'm just talking Tucson, you know. There's, um, protection networks are really interesting too because they're uh, usually of undocumented and documented people that live in the community who are all in communication with each other. So if somebody gets pulled over by the police, if you get pulled over by the police in Tucson and they suspect you're undocumented, first you're in the 100 mile zone, so it's the 100 mile zone, so they'll call Border Patrol. But second, it's SB 1070. And SB 1070, the, the, the immigration law that passed in 2010, obligates a police officer if they suspect that you don't have documents to call Border Patrol. So people are getting Border Patrol called on them constantly by the police. And, um, and so the protection networks, if you're pulled over by the, by the police, they'll call, you know, you call whoever's on call. And then all of a sudden, there's a whole group of people that mobilize. They'll come out to the area. Um, but there's also, you know, a protection network also, if you are detained, they'll go in and take care of your children. You know, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, interesting stuff. And, that, and then there's national immigration rights movements. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in, in here I've been hearing about. There you go. So, you, so <laughs> Colorado is a stellar example, you know. So there's a lot of, there's hope, you know, there's hope, you know, hope, there's a lot. There's a lot of you know different people that are doing in organizations that are that are standing up, it, but at the same time, it's so remarkable. Um, especially you know, I travel if I travel the East Coast, especially how little people you know. There's people that know what's going on on the on the U.S. Mexico border, but uh, it's amazing how many people don't know what's going on there. It's just it's just amazing to me. Like there's a you know there's a wall. <laughs> You know, stuff that, that we might take for granted that we know, it's just, it's, it's, it's quite um, startling that how many people don't know what's going on. Can you recommend a documentary, maybe? Um, a documentary, The Undocumented is a good one. That's, a, that's about Arizona. And, and then you. The Constitution Free Zone, and I, I can't go to sleep tonight until. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? No? Yeah. So that's the ACLU's term. It's, I, I, would, uh, I would say the constitutional mangled zone. <laughs> um, mainly because, so the, the reason, the, the logic behind the ACLU is that your Fourth Amendment right to search and seizure is altered, mangled. And those zones, like around where I live, the checkpoints, they can pull you, they can do visual inspections. If they deem you one of the three, one of their three missions raises the alarms, they can look through your stuff. They can ask you, interrogate you, you know, at the same time, speaking of your, of, of the last question of the pushback, there's now people that are pushing back against that. So I would almost call it a constitution and debate zone <laughs> because there's people going through these checkpoints that are saying, that are refusing to speak um, to the, saying, do I have to answer this? I don't, it's my constitutional right not to answer you. I don't, you know, so there is pushback. And there is an organization that de just developed in Arivaca, Arizona, that's mon the first one I think that has existed that is actually monitoring the checkpoints. So they go out to a, a Border Patrol checkpoint and they sit out there with binoculars and they watch every single person that they question, and especially if they're pulled into secondary. So, do you, sir? Yeah, oh, that's good. That's 
that's a good segue to start wrapping up in this. And this, this picture actually is on the southern border of Mexico with Guatemala. I just went on a trip there a week ago. A week ago, I was in, on this border. I was on this border interviewing that very soldier. Um, that's, that, that, uh, um, I went there because of the stuff that's happened over the summer to look into the, you know, the, the upsurge of immigration from Central America, but particularly to look at how Mexico is building up its southern border with a lot of U.S. funding. And so that was the, 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 the angle that I was looking at. And one of the things that, they, that Mexico has done is created three enforcement belts. And this is right on the Guatemala border. Um, and, uh, and one of them was to deploy 2,000 soldiers on the border and 400 police right on the border. And then the second one is a bunch of immigration checkpoints, more than people in the Southwest United States complain. Whew. I went from the Guatemalan border north, north to the town of Arriaga, and Arriaga is where the train leaves, the beast, the bestia, that's where that leaves. So a lot of people will travel, have to travel up through this kind of gauntlet of uh, checkpoints. Um, I went through six checkpoints to get to this in checkpoints where you're talking about constitution free zone totally constitution free zone. there i mean you know i had to open up my bags you know every almost every time you know interrogated you know pull at one at one of them everyone had to get off the bus so what happens is the central american pe folks they they get off they try to they, they either walk the 200 miles or the 150 miles to get to Arriaga, and that's where they get the train so they walk those 150 miles or they, get, they go on public transportation, get out of the public transportation before the checkpoints, evade the checkpoints, get on it, and keep going. So, that's, so you see the kind of similar evasion of the border, you know, of the border apparatus that you see in the, in the southern border. If you could turn the slide off. Um, this guy, I interviewed him uh, on my trip. He, was, he is from Honduras. Um, he... Uh, was at the immigration checkpoint or no, the immigration um, migrant shelter in Arriaga. He had been there for two, uh, two weeks. He and his wife were traveling north. They, had, they, they were actually tried to get to Arriaga the first time, but they were deported because they didn't get out of the, out of the, out of the bus or out of the, out of the van at a checkpoint. So they were hoping that the, the guy, the, the agent at the checkpoint, wasn't going to ask him for their papers. And, he asked everyone, and he just ended up showing him his, his laminated card from Honduras, and he was deported. He was a taxi driver, a taxi driver um, for 12 years in Tegucigalpa, which is the, which is the capital of Honduras. Um, the first six years, it was, you know, scratching by, barely making ends meet, but okay. The last six years, uh, higher and higher extortions from like a more ingrained kind of organized crime network where he's paying almost $9 a day to this network, making less money. And, um, and he talked a lot about the coup, the military coup that happened in Honduras in 2009 and kind of the upsurge of, of uh, violence that happened in the country and the downsurge of, uh, the upsurge of poverty as well. So if you look at the stats in Honduras, poverty, extreme poverty, um, unemployment, underemployment, everything has gone up since this military coup in 2009 where uh, the, the president was overthrown. The president actually was, one of the reforms the president was, 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 was giving was a, a, a very moderate raise in minimum wage, but he was ousted in 2009. So he talked about a lot about like that and the idea that with no opportunities, the correlation between the upsurge in crime. Um, and it became untenable for, for him and his family and his three children. In his case, he left his three children in Tegucigalpa. So he and his wife were trying to travel north um, to get to the United States. Their idea was to get a, a stable job in the United States and then bring their children up after that. Um, so that was his story. If you could do it one more. And, when I was there uh, in Honduras, or not in Honduras, in Arriaga, where the trains, there was tons of operations going on in the train yards by Mexican immigration. So M Mexican immigration accompanied by the army and um, the police. 
And if you look at Mexico's been bolstering its borders with at least um, helped by funding from the United States. So they got all kinds of new technologies. The United States has given like night vision goggles, um, motion sensors, stuff that you'd see on the US-Mexico border. They're helping them build facilities. They're giving them like kind of contraband detection, you know, equipment. Um, and to keep people in? no, to stop Central American immigration. Oh, Central American. It's Central American immigration. So Mexico is now one U.S. official said our, our border is no longer with with Mexico. Our border is now the Chiapas border with with Guatemala. So this. So one of the things that had, Mexico announced a new kind of border enforcement plan in July, and one of them was to do operations around the train so people wouldn't board the train. And uh, they, so at, we went to the train yard in Arriaga, and everyone said, oh, people are not here anymore. There used to be lots of Central Americans here, but they're not here anymore. But if you go two miles, three miles down the rails, you'll find them you know, hiding right by the rails. They'll be about, so I, went, I walked like three miles down the, down the rails, and uh, I met a group, and one of the groups, one of the, it was a group of about 10 people. This guy right here is from Guatemala, and, he's, and he told me, he said, do you want to know why I'm going north? And he, and, he, and he said, he, pick, he pulled out his wallet and he pulled out a picture of his son. That's his son. He hadn't seen his son since 2006. His son was 10 years old in that picture. His son is now 18 years old. Um, he said, that's why I'm going to Miami. I'm going to Miami. And then he said, I've been deported three times. I have no money. And he's sitting by the rails, right? So they're, he, him and this group are sitting by the rails for this train, and everyone knows how dangerous this train is, right? They're barely, they're in Arriaga. They're about to go through the worst dangerous parts. So, but he said, and he'd already been deported three times, but he said, I'm going to make it no matter what because of my kid. And then he pulled out, and he said, take a picture of this and show it to, to the people in the United States. And so did that, and that's a picture of his, of his child. And I don't know where that guy is now. It was a week and a half ago. And he was by the rails, and I mean, for I don't know where he is. He had no money. He could be. I hope. I hope he's at least in Mexico City. You know. I hope. But he, that guy's traveling right now, and he's trying to meet his son. So. That's um. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> um.